Uh, the title of today's sermon, um, as you probably have seen or maybe read somewhere, is Hanging on a Piece of Wood. Hanging on a Piece of Wood. Um, when we are in a situation, when we're in a situation like a, a crisis <laughs> or a, a fight, a situation like a fight, or when we're faced with a problem uh, or a dilemma, uh, listen, we think we are fighting it. We think we're fighting it. Or we think we are going up against this situation, like a crisis and a dilemma and a problem. We think we're going up against it based on the condition of that situation. Based on the condition of that situation. Okay, or by the measure of that situation. The measure of that situation. In, in, for instance, how big or how small it is. It, it, it is, or how strong or how weak it is, how hard or how easy uh, it might be. And then we uh, adjust and we act accordingly, right? Now that sounds logical as I, just, uh, as I was saying that. I'm sure you're like, yeah, that makes sense, and it seems to make a lot of sense. But I would beg to differ, or I disagree with that actually. I don't think that is actually very true. Because when we are in a situation like a crisis or a problem or a dilemma, when we are in a situation, we fight not based on the condition of that situation. We fight based on the condition of our faith. You don't have to say amen. That's, not, that's really not an amen yet because you're probably like, wait, I'm not get it, I didn't get it yet. Okay, I said it again. Based on the condition, I'll say it more simply, based on the condition of ourselves. How about that? Based on the condition of who we are. Okay? Many of you know, those of you who know me, I've done a sport called judo for a very, for quite a long time. A, lo a big portion of my life I, I did judo. And I was highly competitive at one point in my life. And those of you who have done any competitive sports in school or whatnot, you'd be able to relate to me as I share this illustration. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's a team sport, it doesn't matter, if, you know, or an individual one. But for me, I remember before every competition and every tournament I, that I've been to, I had to, specifically for the sport of judo, I had to make weight, right? Make weight to fight in my division in my weight class. So there's a specific weight class that I have to make. And that meant... For me, sometimes I had to lose up to 20 pounds, 20 pounds in a very short period of time, okay? So, uh, you know, that's a, that's a lot. <laughs> that's a lot. And it's not really losing the weight, right? It's just losing a lot of water weight, but 20 pounds. And so there were times, actually <laughs> every time, when I had to starve myself. I had to starve my, go in extreme fasting, right? Not eat at all. Uh, just maybe liquid so I don't die for days and sometimes weeks. That's how I would go on. And all this is happening. All right? I don't just sit still. I am conditioning. While I'm conditioning myself in extreme workouts. I mean, it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's like killing two birds with one stone, right? You work out hard and you're losing weight. And a whole lot of running. Extreme workouts and a whole lot of running. Which is why, by the way, I have PTSD. I really do uh, with running and working out. And I am slowly but surely getting back to it. Anyways, when the day, was, uh, when the day comes for the competition, um, that day, when the weigh-ins are usually uh, in the morning okay, of that day, a few hours before I get on the mat to fight, to compete. Just a few hours before. Remember, I just lost 20 plus pounds, 20 pounds uh, to fight, uh, to compete at this tournament. Now, in that state or condition, when I'm facing my opponent, when I'm there on the mat and I'm about to face, I'm about to, you know, compete, fight this guy, my number one concern is not who I am up against. It's not. I mean, that's important. And I do look into that too. But it's not my number one concern. But in that state, in my state, in my condition, I just didn't eat for the last couple of weeks to lose these 20 pounds. I'm not fighting him. <laughs> I'm not fighting that other guy that's in front of me. I am truly, in a essence, I am fighting with myself. I'm fighting myself. Listen, I'm not fighting with my, uh, with my logic. Okay, I'm not fighting with my logic. I already lost logic, didn't eat for two weeks, just weighed in, and I'm up there fighting. I'm fighting with instincts. Do you understand? This is a, right? I'm fighting with instincts. I'm not fighting with physical strength. I have no strength at that moment. I have none. 
I'm fighting with spirit, right? With gut, right? With gut. So that's really the, the condition. I'm like a mad dog, a crazy, a dog gone crazy, fighting as I was conditioned to fight. Fighting as I was conditioned to fight. Okay. And if I lost that match, if I lost that match, at least I have no regrets. Right? I gave it all. Or if I lost that match, you can also think of it this way, I have no one else to blame other than myself. I have no one else to blame other than me. Now, the reason why I'm saying this is because I know plenty of people who blame the other guy, who blame the other team, who blame the condition of the situation, who make a whole lot of excuses and a whole lot and have a whole lot of reasons of why they lost the match. Oh, it's because the referee was unfair, and that might be true. That might be true. Oh, it's because the other guy is better, obviously. That's why you lost. But at the end of the day, when they go home, when that guy goes home, they have to see themselves in a mirror, right? They're going to have to see themselves in a mirror. When we fight based on the condition of the situation, you're going to come up with endless amount of excuses. Oh, it's because of the coronavirus. I mean, that might be true, and that it's probably true. Oh, it's because my family is crazy. But I mean, whose family isn't crazy, right? Oh, it's because this happened to me. Oh, it's because that happened to me in my life. And this is it's because of this past in my life. And that all might be true. But at the end of the day, you come to realize you had no say, really, in the condition of the situation. You had no say in making a causing or some effect in the condition of the situation. Right? You were in that situation actually fighting based on the condition of your faith. Right? It's not the condition of the situation. It's based on the condition of of your faith. Now, I'm not using a sport illustration to illustrate a spiritual truth in life. That's not what I'm doing. Why? Because in everything that we do, in everything that we are, we are physical and we are spiritual. We cannot separate the two or else it means what? You're dead, literally, if you separate the physical and the spiritual. In everything that we do, we do it with faith. We do. I'm talking about everyone. The question is, what or who do we have faith in? Do we have faith in ourselves, right? That's pretty common. Faith in our strength. Faith in my ability. Faith in our friends. Faith in our family. Faith in money. Faith in materialistic things. Faith in our situation. Trusting in the situation. Now, I don't know about you. As I just listed all those things, but I don't trust myself. I don't. I, I absolutely don't. I don't have faith in myself. And, and some of you people will be like, wait, that's not a good thing to say about. No, I don't. I don't trust myself. I failed myself way too many times in my life. I betrayed myself for so long to have faith in me. I have no faith in me. And I'm sorry to say the next thing because I know my mom and dad are watching right now in Chicago. They're watching this at this time. And I know my wife is watching this from home and worshiping with us. But I don't trust you all either. <laughs> I love you with all my heart, mom and dad and my wife, Karen. And I, and, I, and I say I would do anything for you. I say that. And I know you would say the same thing to me. But as they say, People are worthy to be loved. I've never heard that people are worthy to be trusted. People are worthy to be loved. Right? Money and material. It will come and it will go. Money and material comes and goes. It will fade. It will break down. It will fall apart in time. Right? That's money and the materials of this world. And look, our world, our situation that we are in comes and it will pass. This coronavirus, it's coming and it's going to pass. It will pass. Things around us change just like the seasons change all the time. And the only one, listen, I'm coming down to the conclusion, the only one who has never changed, the only who won, one who was and is and always will be faithful is, you guessed it, Jesus Christ. That's right, it's Jesus Christ. And the only thing that will never change is the promise of God we have in Christ Jesus. Amen?
It's the promise of God we have in Christ Jesus will never change. Listen to what Jesus says at the very end of the Gospel of Matthew. Right? The very end is the last verse of the first book of the New Testament, right? And I will be with you till tomorrow. No, always, he says. And I will be with you always to the very end of the age, he says. He says, I will always be with you to the very end. I will always be with you. And look into the Old Testament. Stay with me because it's, I think it's going to get better. But look into the Old Testament at, as we see it, as it unravels, right? Unravels and it culminates to the coming of Christ, right? That's what the whole Old Testament is. You read all over the place in the Old Testament, throughout the history of God's people, from the beginning of Genesis all the way to the last book of the book of Malachi. It said, I will never forsake you. You hear that message all throughout. Yeah, I will never leave you. You hear that message all throughout. I will never let you go. God is constantly telling us that. I will be with you when you pass through the waters. I will be with you when you pass through the rivers. Right? I will be with you when you walk through the fire. You will not be burned because I will be with you and the flames will not consume you. Amen? Yeah, Isaiah 43 verse 2. Right? I just added a lot of I, I will be with you because that is the semantics of the verse right there. I will be with you through all of this. And Jesus says, I will be with you always to the very end of the age. Right? Look, and it's not like how I said it to my wife on, uh, on uh, you know, our wedding day. It's not like how I said it. Because death will part us. And death will part us. Till death do we part is our condition of my love for my wife, right? That's the condition. But because God so loved the world, unconditionally, not no, unconditionally, because God so loved the world, he sent his one and only son, Jesus, to us, for us. And Jesus, what did he do? He went to the cross for your sins and my sins. He died on the cross for us, right, on our behalf. He was buried. He died. He buried in the grave with our sins. But on the third day, early Sunday morning, Jesus rose from the dead. He resurrected from the grave. He defeated death. He came alive. He defeated the devil. He washed our sins away by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what happened. And after all that has happened, listen, after he's what? In my, proven himself, right? He's fulfilled scripture. He's proven himself. He goes and he says to his disciples, and he says to, and he says to us today, and I will be with you always to the very end of the age. It wasn't before that. It was after that, right? He's alive, the living God, right? And I will be with you always to the very end of the age. And that is what we call the promise of God. Amen? You got to say amen at home. You know what I'm saying? You got to be a good example to your kids who are sitting next to you. Right? <laughs> Sons and daughters, you got to be a good example. Amen. Right? You got amen to that. That is the promise of God. He said it all throughout the Old Testament. Right? He said that basically all throughout the Old Testament. And he did what he said he would do on the cross. And the resurrected living God says it again for us today. And I will be with you always. Look, I will be with you in the midst of the storm. I will be with you in the midst of your struggles. I will be with you in the midst of your brokenness. Look, it doesn't matter what we are going through right now. And no, it doesn't. It doesn't matter how crazy the situation is. I'm not just talking about what coronavirus, I, there's, there's problems in your life. And on top of that, we have coronavirus. I understand that. But I'm not talking about that, how crazy the condition of your situation might be. If Jesus is with us, amen? If Jesus is with us, we will get through it. We're going to get through it. That was two weeks ago, two Sundays ago's message, I think, or was it last Sunday, that we're going to get through it, right? We're going to get to the other side based on the condition of our faith in Jesus Christ, right? Based on the condition of our faith in Jesus Christ for whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Amen. Right? Wh whoever believes in Jesus will not die, but have life eternal for whoever believes in him. And that's a big amen because he is Emmanuel God. That's another one. He is Emmanuel God. He is God with us, right, through the storm. He is God with us through the crisis. Look, 
this message that is being preached right now, it's not for people, for you, if it's, for, if it's not for you, people who are digging into your savings account. You're listening to this, it's probably going one ear and out the other. It's not. This message is not for people who are agitated and restless from being at home for so long, being, you know, isolated and quarantined at home with your kids, you know, moms and dads, right? This message is for the faint of heart, right? The heart about a faint. The ones who are hitting rock bottom in their life right now. The ones who have been cornered back to the coast of the Red Sea and have no way out and it's impossible. This message are for the, are those who are praying, waiting for a child for 25 plus years at the age of 99 years old. These are the, this message is for the ones who are completely outnumbered and surrounded by their enemies. This message is for those who have been thrown into the fire and into the lion's den. And when you hear this, you can't just sit here when God is telling you that I am with you through it all. Amen? Right? I'm with you through it all. In the midst of the impossibility, God is the God of possibility. And Jesus says it again, and I will be with you always to the very end of the age. This is the promise of God that our faith is based upon, right? This is the promise of God. Listen, and it's a promise. Uh, it's a promise. What I, because, listen, it's a promise. Think, right? Because he knows you and I cannot see. We can't see in the midst of the storm. We can't see through the storm. He knows it. That's why it's a promise. He knows in the midst of crisis and uh, trauma, our emotions, right, our senses, our eyes, our, what, what, our senses are completely haywired. We're out of control in the midst of crisis, in the midst of trauma. He knows that we can't trust our emotions, yet we think we, we do, don't we? Right? He knows we can't, we shouldn't trust our emotions during times of trauma and crisis. Right? Peter thought Jesus was a ghost. Remember that a few weeks ago, a couple weeks ago? And that message, when he was in the midst of the storm, Peter, Peter thought it was a ghost. He couldn't see in the midst of the storm God himself. And I know some of you might be crying right now. Where is Jesus in my struggle? Right? Where is Jesus in, in my cancer, in my chemotherapy? Where is Jesus right now? Where is Jesus in my broken family when everyone is just constantly fighting in my house? Where is Jesus in my debt and, and the joblessness and that I lost my job? Where is he? Where is Jesus in my infection? And in my disease. Where is Jesus? But that is why, listen, it is a promise. That's why it's a promise. Jesus would not promise you if you could see it. Right? Jesus would not promise you if you could see it. Jesus promises you because he knows you might doubt it. That's why you promise it. Right? I don't promise my, sons and my, my son and daughter something that they already have or they already see. Right? You might doubt it. That's why it's a promise. When I was driving to church early this morning, I come very early in the morning, pretty much at night. It was dark, and it was pouring rain, that Virginia rain, pouring rain. And I couldn't see where the big puddles were while, while I was driving. Right? I couldn't see at all. It was raining very hard at, at, at very early in the morning. And I couldn't see if there was a deer that might cross by over the road or a fox going by. I couldn't see any of that. I was hydroplaning a couple times. <laughs> Thank God I'm still here, right? You know, I couldn't see it. That's why when we are in the midst of a storm, we cannot trust our senses. We doubt, don't we? What we see in front of us, we doubt. That's why the Bible says, the righteous shall live by faith and not by sight. Amen. Right? The righteous shall live by faith and not by sight. You may not know it, but Jesus is with us in the storm. Amen. He is. You may not feel it, but he is with us in the storm. Jesus is with us even though we may not see it at all. Because he promised us. He will be with us always to the very end of the age. To the very end. And you and I are, what? Basing our faith in the promise of God that we have in Christ Jesus. Amen. Right? I know when, some, okay, when someone is with you, uh, it's a great thing. Right? It's a great thing. It's not only comforting to have someone with you, but, you know, it might even extend your life, 
<laughs> it's true. It might even extend your life. Listen, uh, years ago when my grandfather passed away, right, when my grandfather passed away, my grandmother, who was completely fine, she was completely fine when my grandfather was alive, uh, but when he passed away, her health all of a sudden started to what? Deteriorate, to deteriorate very quickly when her husband passed. Now, right, now that she had no one to take care of, of, now that she was living all alone in her senior apartment where she was at, her mental ability, her physical ability, all got worse and worse noticeably. It wasn't gradual. We could see it just drop, and she passed away a lot earlier than we anticipated. Right? And I've heard this to be true in us human beings. Right? It's not just my family situation. We live and we know we live. We know we live when we are with someone. It's hard to tell if I'm living when I'm by myself, but we know we live when we're someone, when we are with someone. And it doesn't even have to be a good relationship. You could be arguing every day and every night with that other person, and it will keep your blood pumping. You can feel your, your heart just going, boom, 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 right? Ugh! You know you're alive. It doesn't have to be a great relationship, although hopefully it is. Right? But I also heard this. It doesn't have to be even a human being that you're living with. Uh, I've seen many, right, many neighbors, uh, elderly, and the senior citizens who live alone. But they're not living alone. They live with what? Uh, they have a pet. They have a pet. Yeah. Uh, they have a small cat or, or some pet that they take care of uh, every day, right? A pet gives them something to do. A pet gives them a purpose, right, in life. Like, I need to be there for my cat. I need to be there and feed uh, my little kitten. And I thought, wow. As I was thinking about it, I said, well, if another human being, no, no, how about another thing? If a pet, an animal can extend your life, if a pet, being with a pet, being with you can extend your life just by being with you, Jesus says, and I will be with you always <laughs> to the very end of the age. Jesus says, and I will be with you always to the very end of the age. Brothers and sisters, when, I, when, that, when that hit my heart and it hit my head, listen, whoever believes in him, listen, whoever believes in Jesus, whoever has faith in Jesus will not perish but have eternal life. Amen? Right? That, it's right there. It's right there. Listen, we are not living alone. We are not living alone. You are not living alone. And I know some of you feel so isolated from everywhere and everything else because of this situation. Listen, we are not alone. If the, if, if the God who is almighty, the wonderful counselor, the everlasting father, the prince of peace is with me, then I am going to get through to the other side. I am going to get through this. Amen? That's right. It's not about positive thinking here. It's about the promise. Actually, I want to call it the truth, the fact of life that God is with me, that Jesus is living in me at this very moment. Amen? Right? That's, that's the hope that we have. And listen, with that said, the Apostle Paul knew that. I, that was just the introduction, actually. But, you know, the, actually, the introduction is longer than the body of the sermon. But anyways, it's okay. So, <laughs> Paul the apostle knew that. It, it, I hope it gets better, too. You got to stay with me. All right? Paul the apostle knew that. We didn't read the portion uh, of the passage here uh, before our passage today. Okay, so if you know the story, great. If you don't, go back to it after you hear and you're, after the worship is done and read uh, this Acts chapter 27, right? Well, uh, but here, I'll just give you a very, very, very brief uh, summary. While Paul was heading towards Rome, and he's, he's a prisoner, right? He's a prisoner uh, towards Rome on a ship, right? They were in the midst of a crazy storm, a hurricane, a, northeast, a northeaster a, a hurricane. And although the sailors tried all that they could in the midst of the storm, they were hopeless for their lives. They thought they were going to die. These professionals are like, okay, I'm, I'm done. This is it. They thought they were going to die in the midst of this hurricane. You can see that in the passages and the verses before our passage today. But Paul says in the passage before, verses 23 to 25, and I'm paraphrasing here, verses 23 to 25, he says, or I'm just taking uh, bits and pieces and you can read it, do not be afraid, he tells them. Paul says, he's not a sailor, do not be afraid. 
Take heart, he says, take heart, for I have faith, he says, I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told, he says. For I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told. This is in the midst of a hurricane, brothers and sisters. In other words, Paul is saying he has faith in God and in what God had promised him. Faith in God and his promise. We see that here exactly what, what the whole introduction was all about. What God had told him, right? And after all that they were going through this, you know, this hurricane, finally, right, they're trusting in Paul's preaching and his word and, and taking that to be truth. They come near to a bay with a beach. Verse 39, that is our passage here. They finally come to, near to a bay with a beach. Finally, they are almost there, away from the sea, away from the storm, away from the hurricane, and onto dry land, dry ground. They're right there. They're right there. And I believe God is giving us this message for us this morning, for us this week, verses 39 to 44, because many of you and I, many of us, are feeling anxious at this very moment. We are feeling frustrated and maybe agitated of being at home for so long. Like, right, you, you don't get to see people outside much. You're staying home, stay at home right now. And we're agitated and frustrated because we're not working and rightly worried about our business and the economy of our country and of this world. And so I see more and more people outside, right? I see more and more people going outside now and even without masks. They don't go outside without masks anymore. Even when the order is still in place where I live, over in Prince William County, they, the order is still there that you have to wear a mask if you could go in the store. But I saw people not wearing masks. That's the situation right now. Why? Because they're hearing in the news right now and they're seeing the protests of people. Right? They're protesting what? To open up the businesses, right? Open up the economy again. And honestly, I, I do. I also want. The small businesses to, to not only survive but to thrive and to do well. I want the economy to come back, to open up as soon as possible, right? Why? Because these are not only just the people but they're also people that I know are church members who are suffering because everything is closed, right? So I want that. But listen, I believe some of this is also coming from our emotions, right? And maybe our distorted senses, Remember, we can't trust our emotions and our senses in a time like this. Why? Because we are so what? Exhausted and tired. And how are you going? How can we trust in that in the midst of the storm? And it does right now, honestly, seem like the curve is flattening. It does seem like it's going towards that direction. And that is that may be true. We're getting there, we're getting there. But I want to say this. I want to say that the most dangerous time is when we are almost there. The most dangerous time is when we are almost there. It really is true, isn't it? Listen, it's really easy to be careful, right? It's easy to be careful when we are in the midst of the storm because our guards are up, right? We, 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 we are ready for it, right? It's really easy to be on guard when we are at the peak of the crisis. We are not going to let down our guard at the peak of the crisis, but as we are going through this situation, like I said, we get exhausted, Right, because we're constantly on guard. We get exhausted. We get tired, fatigued. Our emotions and our, you know, mental abilities get drained. Get drained. And, you know, people in psychology, or counselors would know exactly what I'm talking about. That's what happens, right? And so that is why coaches in sports, like specifically football, they keep on chanting to their team, what? We have to fight the full 60 minutes, right? It's a 60-minute game. It's not a 59-minute. It's a 60-minute game. I've seen an entire game flip over in the last two minutes of the game. No, one last minute of the game, even seconds of the game. They thought they were going to win, and they lose at the last part. I've had matches personally in judo where I was losing and then, but I won at the very last few seconds. Listen, it's more dangerous to go down the mountain than going up. Isn't that true? It's more dangerous when you're going down. And I read somewhere uh, online that most car accidents happen when? Like when you're five minutes away from home. Right? When you're almost there. When you're almost there, it happens. When things seems to be get, seem to be getting better, we want to, listen, we want to go back to what? What we, how we 
lived before, right? We want to go back to how it was before. When things are getting closer to the end, we want to do what we always did, what we used to do before all this coronavirus thing happened. But God did not allow all of this that is happening right now so that you and I can go back to how we used to live. Can you say amen to that? You agree with that? God does not want us to go back to how we used to live. God did not allow this storm, this hurricane, this situation we are in to happen so that we can go back to trusting in ourselves, right? Trusting in our ways, relying on what, how I feel, doing what I feel like doing, our emotions and doing what we used to do. He wants us to, right now, to trust him all the way, the full 60 minutes, right? Using that illustration of the football game, the full 60 minutes. He wants us to have faith in him until we get to the other side. Until we get to the other side. This is not the time for us to break apart. Listen, before Paul and the people on the ship saw the bay, before they saw the bay, they were busy. You, you, we didn't read it together. It's just a few verses up. What were they doing? They were busy sorting things out on the boat. Listen, sorting things out. They were looking at what is essential and what are non-essentials. Hmm, right? Hmm, that's, that's I, oh yeah, yeah, it's essential and non-essential. They knew that if they kept everything, the ship would break apart and they would drown and die. They knew that. And so they tossed this out, they tossed that out, and finally they tossed out the wheat. They tossed, they kept what they thought was essential. But Paul already warned them in verse 22, which we didn't read. But this is what he says in verse 22. He says, yet now I urge you to take heart for there will be no loss of life among you. So he says, there will be no loss of life among you. Even in the midst of this hurricane and the storm, no loss of life. But only the ship, he says. This is in verse 22 before everything happened. Only the ship. In other words, the ship will be a loss. The ship will go down. That's basically what he's saying. Listen, the government made decisions on what was essential and what are non-essentials. That's what the government did for us. Told us what are essential and what are non-essential. But you and I, as we listen to that, as we're going into the word of God and as we're really trying to think and, and, and seek what God is trying to say to us, have you and I been, have we been sorting things out in our life? What are essential in our lives? What are non-essential in our lives? Have we? Have we taken time to, the time to reflect and to pray and to and take action into sorting these things out, the idols of our lives, when we have the time to do it, right? The things that have been distracting us from God. Or are we, are, or are we already busy now that things are getting better, desiring and wanting and trying to go back to the life that we used to live? Don't you remember? <laughs> you must remember. I remember. We used to be so busy in ministry. So busy in ministry. So busy in life. In the morning you wake up, you're restless in the morning. And you sleep restless. You're just so busy in life without God. Without his promise, his word in our lives. And now that we're getting closer to the other side, are we trying to save the ship? Are we trying to save the ship? Are we trying to salvage what we can in this time? And so you know what God does? God destroyed that ship. That's in our passage. God allowed that ship to be shipped, shipwrecked right in front of the bay. Right in front of the bay. Right at the finish line. Paul knew that in verse 22. Sons and daughters of God, you know it. I know it. God does not want us to bring the old into the new. He cannot pour new wine into old wineskin. It will burst. Right? Jesus tells us that. But instead, when the ship went down, when the ship, went, when the ship was wrecked, verse 44, the people were hanging onto the pieces of the ship. Last verse. They were hanging onto the plank, hanging on a piece of wood, Hanging on a piece of wood. The ship that they thought would save them. The ship that they thought would get them across to the other side. The ship that was supposed to bring them security was now in pieces. And the only thing that they could hang on to was the promise of God. What 
Paul told them the promise of God. It was the promise of God that Paul was constantly trying to preach to them. And right before our passage, more proof of that, Paul was even doing communion service. Right? Look at it. He was, he was communion service right before. With them in the midst of the storm, verse 35, he was doing communion service. He took bread, right? He gave thanks to God in the presence of all. That's what it says in that verse 35. And he broke it. He broke it. He broke it into pieces and began to eat it, right? He broke it into pieces began to eat it. Listen. Example, right? The disciples could not understand Jesus. They thought they were going to be princes, princes and rulers, right? In the new kingdom over the Roman Empire that through Jesus they're going to have, they're going to have, we're going to wear crowns and we're going to be on thrones over the entire world. But when Jesus took them to the upper room his fine, during his final supper, before he went to the cross, he gave thanks and he broke bread. And he said to them, take this and eat it. He broke the bread into pieces and he said to eat it. This is my body. And then he took a cup, he gave thanks, and he said, drink it. For this is my blood of the covenant. And listen, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Right? That's, that was what he was trying to tell them. He was telling them, I'm telling you, I'm gonna, I have to go and die. I have to, this is death for me. And later that night, Jesus was arrested. And then he was taken to be beaten. He was whipped. He was ridiculed. He was mocked. And the disciples were clueless as to what was actually happening. Even though Jesus was telling them, told them specifically in the Bible, three occasions of what's going to happen. They thought Jesus would be their king and that they would be rulers and lords uh, under him. But instead, everything was falling apart. Everything was falling apart. Their dreams were in pieces, in broken pieces. Their lives were in danger at the time. Their leader is being beaten and crucified. And now he's up there hanging on a piece of wood. Hanging on a piece of wood. Hanging on a piece of wood. The promise of God hanging on a piece of wood. The promise of God and hanging on a piece of wood. Paul and those people were hanging on a piece of wood. And hanging on the piece of wood saved their lives. Got them to the other side. There was nothing left. Everything was gone. But the only thing left standing was the promise of God. The promise of God hanging on a piece of wood. The promise of God hanging on a piece of wood. Brothers and sisters, we might have lost a lot of things in the storm. But we're not trying to salvage this. That's not what God is calling us to do. God gave us a piece of wood to hang on. Because he did not promise, he did not promise your things would be safe. He did not promise your things. Would be, he promised you. I will be with you. Nothing else. I will be with you. Me and your nice Mercedes Benz, me and your nice fat home will be with you. No, he didn't, he didn't promise anything else. He didn't promise, I will be with you to the very end. Everything else may break apart. Everything else may go away. Everything else will fade away. But I will be with you to the very end. I showed you that. All you need, all I need is Jesus. And so let us look to Jesus when he was hanging on a piece of wood. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I just give thanks to you, uh, Lord, that you have given us a very relevant message here today for us in the midst of all this, uh, the coronavirus and the crisis that we are in. And Lord, help us, Father, to be reminded once again, Lord, that God, it's not about the things around us, Lord. Help us, Father, to steer away from that. Help us to steer away from trying to salvage or go back to what we are used to. But help us to look to you, follow you, trust in you, the one who truly is the saving one, the Savior. Help us, Lord, 
to cling on to you and trust in you in the time, in this time, to get to the other side. Not because of anything else you've promised, but the only thing that you promised that you would be with us. Father, we hold on to that promise today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And church, let us respond now with this song. That indeed, we worship the one who saves, the one who has already given us life through the life of Christ. So let's sing this song together in response. Selflessness and peace, my fear was surely sealed until he rescued me. His pardon for my sin, his bounty for my need. From slavery and shame, I am redeemed, and heaven can contain the glory of the Son. Jesus is the Christ, the saving one. His love has made a way, the grave is overcome. Jesus is the Christ, the saving one. No fear can hold me down, no darkness steal my joy. Blood has been poured out, the enemy destroyed. Death could not hold him down. The cross was not enough to steal away his throne. For he is God, and heaven can contain the glory of the Son. Jesus is the Christ. The saving one, his love has made a way, the grave is over. Jesus is a Christ, the saving one. And anyone who calls upon his name, they will be saved. Thank you so much for your one and only son god that you have sent your one and only son to come and die for us and for our sins on the cross to be buried in the grave to bury our sins to put death to death to come alive on the third day 
and to give us that very hopeful message, a true hope that we have in Jesus Christ, that we have when we fix our eyes on Jesus, that we have when we put all our faith in Christ, especially in the midst of the storm. Father, I pray let not one soul be left behind. I pray that everyone may turn their eyes to the one and only Savior, Jesus Christ. And I pray all this, and I pray that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the eternal, everlasting love of our Father in heaven and the wonderful work and ministry, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be upon all of your sons and daughters in the midst of this, the coronavirus crisis. Be upon all of your children, God. Lord, help us, Father, to hang on to that piece of wood, to be reminded of Christ who was hung on that piece of wood. Be with us from now and forevermore. Amen.